Hello, my name is Alicia Drake and welcome back to Coffee and Conversations. Our goal is to create transparency in the world of real estate and to expose the hidden nuances that are typically only privy for agents and brokers. Today, my guest is Steve Scholl. He is the leading real estate coach in the country and has coached thousands of the top producers across the United States. Steve, hi. Thank you for having me. He has not only been doing this for 30 plus years, but you were an all-star football player for the Miami Dolphins. I wouldn't say all-star. <laughs> I did play four years in the NFL. So Steve, I brought you here to talk to us about and share your thoughts around what the biggest mistakes are that sellers make when they're selecting an agent to sell their house. Well, I knew you were gonna ask me that question. <laughs> So I made a lot of notes, all right? Excellent. So if you're a potential seller watching this, what you wanna do is you wanna stack the odds in your favor. You wanna give yourself the best chance for success. And there are, thing, there, there are no guarantees when it comes to selling your home. And there are things you can do to help yourself and there are things you can do to hurt yourself. So, first of all, I think it's important to say from the outside looking in, real estate looks easy. And as a seller, you're thinking your agent's job isn't that tough. And once you're on the other side though, the job is a lot more complicated, a lot more nuanced than, than it seems. And so, don't think as a seller that this is an easy process. Some sellers think, especially in a market like this, the home is gonna sell itself. It's a hot market, they've got a good home, good location, and I've been doing this 30 plus years, I have yet to see a home sell itself. How about you? Never. <laughs> Another thing, in, in, uh, in addition to thinking homes sell themselves, which is simply not true, many sellers may think that all agents are the same, all agents do the same thing, and all agents generate the same results. And again, that is simply not true. In fact, the, the agent that you pick can impact the final sales price by anywhere from one to 10% or more. And so there is a big difference in terms of the agents that you work with. In terms of if you're a seller and you wanna have a successful transaction, then you have to have a clear objective in terms of what it is you wanna accomplish. And you going in, you wanna know what your priorities are. Is it the highest price? Is it a quick sale? Is, is timing what's most important? Is convenience the thing that's most important? Ease? Uh, you also have to be clear with your agent. Are you okay if they sell the home themselves? This is an issue that should be brought up front. You know, do you want your agent also representing a buyer, which, which can happen? That's something you want to be clear about. And you also want to be very clear in terms of how you want to be communicated with. How do you want to be communicated? Phone call, email, text, how often? And then how much do you need to know on a daily, weekly basis? So again, upfront, being very clear about what you want to accomplish. That's critical in terms of uh, having a successful sale. And along those lines, you wanna be very, very transparent with your agent. You know, you're not adversaries. You're in this together. And a classic example of that when you're interviewing an agent is oftentimes the agent will say to the potential seller, what do you wanna sell your home for? And sellers will go, well, that's why you're here. You're the expert. You tell me. Don't play a guessing game with your agent. You have to let them know, again, what it is you want to accomplish. So 
being transparent is important. Being collaborative with your agent is important. Again, you're in this together. It's teamwork. And you want to be a team as you go through this process. Don't be a micromanager. Pick an agent that you trust. Get out of the way and let them do their job. If you feel you have to oversee and you have to manage everything, then that simply means you don't have the right agent. So again, pick someone that you can trust and you feel comfortable letting them do their job. A great agent has a process. Let them work the process. Uh, another mistake that some sellers make is wanting to sell their property off market. It's called a pocket listing. And again, I, I, I can understand if a seller for privacy reasons doesn't want to know, doesn't want anyone to know that they're selling, that may be a reason that they want to uh, sell their home off market. However, if you want to get top dollar for your home, you need to list it on the MLS. You need to expose it to the, the largest net of potential buyers. And that way you get, again, stack the odds in your favor and give yourself the best chance for success. Picking an agent based on price. Many sellers have this idea that the agent who gives them the highest price is the agent who most believes in their home. And that simply is not true. Some agents, not all, they want the listing and they're willing to give whatever price the seller wants, knowing that if the price is too high, they're gonna try and work that seller down later on. So again, don't pick your agent based on the price they give you. Pricing, again, needs to be a collaborative thing where you're going to sit down and together with your agent, the two of you are going to come up with what the right price is. And when it comes to price, when someone gives you a high price, it's hard not to get anchored to that high price. Let's say you're going to interview three people and your home is worth $2 million. And an agent comes in and says, well, I think I can get you 2.5 million. Now, where they're getting that number, who knows? However, as a human being, you're gonna get anchored to that price. And it's gonna be really hard to think, well, maybe I might be able to get that price. So be very clear, you look at the numbers, you know, it's pretty black and white, this is not really rocket science in terms of picking a price. So don't be fooled by an agent who gives you that high price and don't get anchored to that high price. Because even in a market like this that's so hot with multiple buyers and multiple offers and, and homes selling well over asking, you can still price your home too high. And that can be a big mistake. The home stays on the market too long and eventually you're chasing after the market and you end up selling for less. Conversely, you can't underprice a home. It's almost impossible to underprice a home. And I know that's kind of counterintuitive. Many sellers think if I have a higher price, I'm going to get more money for the home and it actually works the other way. Again, especially in a market like we're in, where there are more buyers and sellers, you don't have to be worried about underpricing your home. The market will bid it up, and that's going to be uh, to your advantage most every time. Another mistake that sellers can make is not prepping their home to the nth degree. And I'm sure you get into this conversation with sellers often. I would imagine most sellers, if they had their choice, they wouldn't want to do anything. They're selling the home. The last thing they want to do is put a lot of money into the home 
right before they're about to leave it. However, again, that is a big mistake. The way you live in a home is not the way you sell a home. And many sellers have obviously their personality in their home. It looks the way they want it to look. And it's great to live in the home that way. However, when you're selling it, you want to take your personality out of the home. You want to make the home as neutral as possible so a potential buyer can actually see themselves in that home. So staging, doing repair work, again, getting the home in the best shape possible, more times than not, you're going to get way more for, in return for any investment you make in getting your home ready for sale. And along those lines, don't be duped into the idea that you want your agent to pay for staging. That's not their responsibility. That's your responsibility as a seller. However, you will find agents who, in an attempt to get your listing, will offer to pay for staging. And on the surface, that seems like a really good thing. However, that'll tie into commission, which we're about to get into in a little bit. Another big mistake that sellers can make is international marketing. Oh, I want you to find an international buyer for my home because they might pay more. That's not reality. And the whole idea of international market, marketing, no agents really have the ability to market your home overseas. That's, that's a bunch of hype and is really not relevant to the sale of your home. In reality, and this is something that's gonna be hard to hear, 90% of the marketing that you do on a home is the price you put on the home. And no amount of marketing can overcome an overpriced listing. You know, often sellers, they put it too high a price, the home isn't selling, and they're thinking, oh, we need to do more marketing. We need an ad in Variety. Or we need a hamburger truck out in front of the open house. Or we need a twilight open. We, you know, all these gimmicks. And again, that doesn't sell a home. So be very smart when it comes to this whole area of marketing. In reality, most agents are going to do the same thing. Some are just better at uh, describing what they do. Now let's talk about the big one, and that is commission. And commissions are negotiable in this business, and most agents are going to charge somewhere between 4 and 6%. Some maybe even a little less, especially in the high end, and we'll, we'll get into that specifically. However, the standard in real estate is really 6%, yet most agents are going to charge 5 And... Picking your agent based on commission or negotiating with your agent on commission, something you really have to think about. And ask yourself this, if you can out-negotiate your agent on their commission, why would you want that person representing you? I'm sure you get into these discussions all the time around commission. Curious, what's your experience? I do, I do, I get into it. My commission is 6%. And is that commission negotiable? It is not negotiable. It is for everyone. They okay. all pay 6%. If you want to know, but let's back up for a second. A question a seller should ask themselves, is my agent's ability to negotiate, is that an important factor in my decision? And if it is, if you want a strong negotiator representing you, the way you can have a real clue as to how a, an agent negotiates is look at the fee that they charge. 
an agent who charges 4% or less, what they're telling you is they give their money away in order to get a deal done. And so if they're willing to give their own money away in order to get a deal done, guess whose money they're going to give away when it comes time to put together an offer? They're going to give away your money. An agent who charges 5%, that agent is playing it safe. They know they're not going to get a whole lot of pushback. You know, when a, when a seller asks the question, what is your fee? That's a real moment of truth for most agents. And again, most agents will say 5% because they're not going to get a lot of pushback. And so the agent who charges 5 you know they like to play it safe when it comes to the negotiation process. The agent who charges 6% or even more, that's the agent who's confident in their ability to negotiate. So if you want a good negotiator on your side, just look at the fee that they're charging you. That'll be a real clue again as to how they negotiate. Another mistake that sellers can make is not understanding that time works against you. The longer your home is on the market, A, the less chance it has to sell, and B, the higher the probability you're going to end up selling for less if you do sell eventually. Time is not your friend. And so when you go on the market, you really want to target selling your home within the first two weeks, the first 30 days. Because once you get past 30 days, then again, the probability of selling begins to decrease dramatically. This is a marketplace where people want new listings. And a listing can get stale very quickly. So if you wait too long to reduce, that can be a real mistake. And so let's say if you do go on the market and you are trying an aspirational price, you want to test the market to see whether someone will pay you that number or not, within the first two weeks, you're going to know what that market response is. Don't sit there and keep waiting and hoping and praying. If you don't get the feedback you like right out of the gate, then be quick to reduce your price. Get in front of things. Don't lag behind where the market is. This is a big cliche in real estate, and you'll hear it from agents. And it's a cliche because it happens to be true. And that is, typically, the first offer is the best offer. And there's a reason for that, because the first offer is the person who's usually the most excited about buying the property. They walk in, they know it's what they want, and they make an offer. And so you really have to think long and hard around whatever that first offer is. That's a real indication of what your home is going to sell for. And again, the idea of waiting for something better, hoping for something better, praying for something better, that, is you, that strategy is usually not going to serve you as a seller. Listening to a family member, a friend, a neighbor, because they all have an opinion. Oh, that's your home. Your home is worth a lot more than that. Oh, that's way too little. Just ask that family member, just ask that friend, just ask that neighbor how many homes they've sold in the last 12 months. Remember, everyone has an opinion. And so be very careful who you're listening to when it comes to selling your home. Know what that person's agenda is. Listing out a friendship, you know, sense of friendship or obligation, that, that can also be a big mistake you make as a seller. You always want to ask yourself, who is the best person to represent me? Now, you may want to list with a friend. That may be your choice. 
Just understand that's the choice that you're making. Listing with a friend versus listing with perhaps the best person to represent you. And that doesn't mean your friend can't be that person. However, you need to think about, are they that person? Poor photography, another big mistake. Your listing is going to be all over the internet. The first thing that people are going to see, the first impression is the photos. And if your agent isn't doing professional photography, don't hire that person. If they think they're going to bring their iPhone in, I don't care how great the iPhone is, or they're going to do it themselves in some way, and you'd be amazed, you'd be amazed when you go on the MLS at the difference in quality between what some agents do around photography and what other agents do. Make sure you do your research. If you're thinking about hiring someone, go look at their listings online. Go look at their photography. Go look at their copy. That'll give you a real indication of what they're going to be doing for you. Another potential mistake is not making your property accessible. You know, if you really tie your agent's hands in terms of when they can show the property, that can be a challenge. You might miss that one buyer who was going to be the buyer for your home. So to the best of your ability, make your home as accessible as possible. In different parts of the country, like Northern California, sellers do all their inspections up front. They have the, you know, everything done. They have all the reports. And if someone's interested in the property, they give them all the reports in advance and say, make your offer based on these reports. In Southern California, it's a little different. You negotiate back and forth, you get an accepted offer, then the potential buyer comes in, does all their inspections, and then you have to go through a whole renegotiation. And from a seller's point of view, that can be a very nerve-wracking experience. And you can bypass all that by doing all your inspections up front. So it's definitely a discussion I would encourage any potential seller to have with their agents, what, what they think the pros are, the cons of doing the inspections up front. You have an opinion on that? Oh, I have a big opinion about that because I started my career 2002 in San Francisco and it was standard. We always did all of our inspections, investigations, and especially in this market, when you're dealing with multiple offers, how silly is it not to have a full packet right there on the table to give to everybody? So you're going to bring me all of your offers, but by the way, be aware of everything that is going on with this house before you do, because I don't want you to try to renegotiate once we get in contract. And that's the thing that makes most sense to me. So at a minimum, if you're thinking about selling your home, absolutely have that discussion with your agent, because that is an option. And I think it'll cut down on a lot of the uncertainty in the transaction. And that's what you as a seller want. You, you, what you're trying to do, A, stack the odds in your favor and make the outcome as certain as possible. So all this being said, if you're a seller, I think the, the, the three biggest qualities that you're looking for, one is trustworthiness. As I said earlier, do you trust your agent? This is a big deal maybe one of the biggest financial transactions in your life. And you want to make sure you're working with a trusted advisor. Second quality, you want to pick someone who's highly competent. Experience matters. And so do your research and pick someone who knows what they're doing. 
someone who's not going to tell you what you want to hear, someone who's going to tell you what you need to hear. And they're not going to be afraid of problems because you are not going through this process without a problem or two or three. Something comes up in every single deal that's just unexpected. Now, if an agent is really good, they can anticipate what the obstacles are going to be, and they're going to help you navigate through those obstacles. However, there's always something that comes up. And so you want someone who's going to be straight with you when there's a problem, not someone who is going to bury it or ignore it or give you a positive spin around it, someone who is willing to confront problems. So trustworthiness, someone who's highly competent, and someone who's a straight shooter. To me, those are the three qualities that you most want to look for. Well, how would you do that? One thing you always want to do is get a list of references from your agent. And call those people. Actually call those people. There's no way to know what the experience is going to be like sitting, you know, just from a meeting in your living room where an agent gives you a presentation of everything they say they're going to do. What they say and what they do can be two very different things. So if you really want to know, then get the list of references and make sure you call people and find out what was the experience like. And if, they, if, someone, if you call someone and they don't want to say anything negative, that's a cue that it probably wasn't a great experience. The last thing I would say on this topic is if you're a seller, in the end, the agent you want to pick is the agent you most want in your corner from start to finish the agent you want guiding you, the agent you want helping you navigate again through this complicated, nuanced process that's filled with surprise, the agent you want negotiating on your behalf, the agent who's going to fight for every last dollar, the agent who's going to make sure you're not leaving any money on the table. And again, go back and listen to the commission discussion again. And then above all, the agent who's always going to put your interests first. That's the agent you want to work with, not the agent who wants a paycheck. And so hopefully all these things give a potential seller something to think about so they can, again, stack the odds in their favor and give themselves the best chance for success. So Steve, next question. As equally as important as it is for a seller to choose his agent, is for an agent to decide who they want to work with. So could you speak to us and to other agents about how they should be selecting or deciding who they want to work with? So my answer to that question is going to be a little bit different than what you expect. Okay. And the first way I'd answer the question is anyone who's watching this as an agent, if you haven't read the book, Never Split the Difference by Chris Foss, you need to go read this book. And I read it about five years ago and it changed everything in my coaching practice. And I'm getting to an answer here. <laughs> what I learned from Chris is by the time you're getting that phone call, which every agent wants, we'd like you, we're thinking about selling our home. We'd like you to come over and talk to us. Every agent is dying to get that phone call. Am I wrong about that? That is correct. All right. Well, guess what, everyone? They've already made their decision about who they're going to work with, or 
they're leaning strongly in a certain direction. And this has been one of the biggest ahas uh, in my entire 30 years of coaching people, that realization. Most agents think that the playing field is level, that the seller has an open mind and they're going over there to make a presentation and if they make a great presentation, they have a really uh, great chance of getting that listing. Well, Chris calls it the favorite or the fool. And you're either the favorite or you're the fool in the game. And what most agents don't realize is most of the time they're the fool in the game. They're just due diligence. That's all they are. And especially top agents, because top agents assume that no matter what appointment they go on, they're going to get the listing because they're a top agent. And I can't tell you how many times in my career I've had this discussion with a client. I, I can't believe I didn't get the listing. I can't believe who they listed with. They listed with someone who doesn't even do business in the neighborhood. How did that happen? Well, how it happened was you were the fool in the game. You never had a shot to begin with. So this whole idea of listing presentations, listing presentations are really just a charade. And so here's the answer to your question. What you want to be determining up front is, am I the favorite or am I the fool? And the way you can do that is the first thing, when you get that phone call, you want to listen. When you start listening for am I the favorite or the fool, you'll start to hear it. The clues have always been there. You just never knew to listen to them before. So the first thing is, are they calling you or are they calling a group of agents? Because if they're calling a group of agents, chances are you're just the fool in the game. The second thing that you want to be looking for, do I fit the profile of what they're looking for? Well, how would you determine that? And the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. So you want to probe and dig in terms of how they have picked an agent in the past if they worked with a real estate agent in the past. And by the way, if they have worked with a real estate agent in the past and they're calling you, you absolutely want to ask the question, why aren't you working with so-and-so? Because chances are they probably will work with so-and-so unless they tell you there's no way we're working with that person again, which you know, one of the questions that you want to ask up front with any potential seller, and you really want to listen to the answer is, why me? I'm sure you know a lot of people. I'm curious, why me? And if they can't answer that question specifically, guess what? You're probably the fool in the game. So again, are they calling you? Or are you just one of many? Do you fit the profile of what they're looking for? Can they answer the question, why you? Can they defend why they want you to work with them? Third thing, are you making any, an emotional connection with that person in your dialogue? And one of the things I teach in my coaching through Chris Foss is the use of what are called labels. As a salesperson, you've been taught your whole career, don't make assumptions. Ask open-end questions. No. You want to label. What are they thinking and feeling? And you know, you're probably thinking this. You're probably feeling that. And what you're looking for, what you're targeting, is a that's right response. When, when that person is saying, that's right, that's right, that's exactly what I'm looking for. You're making an emotional connection. You're getting in alignment. 
one of the, the things that, that's absolutely missing from sales training, and it's the most important piece when you're dealing with someone, it's not just understanding what they want, it's your ability to make them feel understood. And when you're labeling what they're thinking and feeling, you're beginning to create that emotional connection so they get that you get what they're thinking and feeling. So can you make an emotional connection? Next, when you're talking to someone, is the conversation collaborative? Is it back and forth? Is it a two-way dialogue? Or are they just asking questions? They're not volunteering any information. If all they want is to ask questions and not offer anything up, again, you're the fool in the game. And the last thing, before you go out to someone's living room to give your presentation, your charade, you want to get a commitment. The way I coach my agents now, they're not going on a presentation without a commitment for that listing of some sort. And again, this all sounds, oh, that, that could never work. Well, guess what? It does. And so the answer to your question, yes, they're not interviewing you. You're interviewing them. However, more importantly, what you're really trying to determine up front, am I the favorite or am I the fool? Because what does it take to get ready for an appointment? Two hours, four hours, depending on how much work you're going to do. Then you got to drive over there. Then you're going to spend another two hours in their living room. And how many times have you, you know, as an agent, have you been on an appointment, you laid out your entire presentation, you nailed it, they were attentive, they were asking questions, and you get to the end of that appointment and they go, oh, thank you so much. You've given us so much to think about. Let us take some time to process everything you said and we'll get back to you. Well, that is the kiss of death. And you walk out of that appointment either thinking you nailed it or having no idea of what they're thinking about. And then you spend the next 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours on pins and needles waiting. Then if the phone rings, if they actually do call you back, you're all excited and they go, you were so great. You were so wonderful. You gave us so much to think about. However, I think we're going to go in a different direction. And it had nothing to do with your presentation. You were simply the fool in the game. And they were doing due diligence. And as a top agent, you need to, a top agent, you need to understand you're the one who's going to get called out more times than not as due diligence because they know you're a top producer and they want to make sure they're not missing anything. So that was probably a little different answer than what that you were looking for. That was a great for. answer and super useful, I'm sure, for everybody watching this and extremely accurate. Again, read the book, Never Split the Difference by Chris Foss. Yes, it is a fabulous book. So much great information. Thank you so much, Steve. I have one last question for you. It's a personal question. How many hours a day do you work? I coach anywhere. I either start at 5 or 5.30 in the morning, and I go back to back till either 6 or 7 o'clock every night, five days a week. Five days a week. Why? What is your why behind what you do in this world? What drives you to put in so much time for so many other people to improve their career? I am just simply obsessed with how to help people enjoy a higher level of success in their life. I, I, I think about it 24 seven. It's just, it's, it's my calling, it's my passion, it's what I do, it's what I love. I never get tired of it. And, 
you know, it gives me the ability to always evolve, grow. I always want to be willing to be smarter today than I was yesterday. And the work I did with Chris Voss is a great example. Prior to Chris, for the first 25 years of my career, I was the guy who was trying to extract emotion out of the equation and boil it all down to fact, logic, and reason. And I read Chris's book and the lightning bolt goes off that people, human beings, make decisions based on emotion, not fact, logic, and reason. And the moment that hit, that enlightenment, you know, I experienced that enlightenment, I did a 180 shift instantly and, you know, changed my entire coaching practice around that. And that's exciting, you know, being able to tap into something new that can really help other people tap in, you know, tap into their unlimited potential. Every human being on earth, every human being has the ability to succeed at a you know, just an extremely high level. And so the idea that I can help them do that, I just love it. That's awesome. Steve, thank you so much. That was amazing and super informative. And I too, by the way, am a huge Chris Foss fan and everyone should definitely read his book, Never Split the Difference. Well, thank you for having me. Greatly appreciate the opportunity.